on that recording. And we will have this recording posted on the Guild's webinar library on our website and also on the Guild's YouTube channel. Uh, so I'll get started now with an introduction um, for our presenter, Jason. Jason M. Brown is a lecturer with the Department of Global Humanities and also teaches with the School of Resource and Environmental Management at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. And Jason's also the History and Philosophy Working Group Chair for the Society of American Foresters. He grew up in California and studied anthropology as an undergraduate and earned joint master's degrees from Yale in forestry and theology. He writes at holyscapes.org and uh, is excited and I'm excited for him as well to announce a new book. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and show you this book cover. Dwelling in the Wilderness, Modern Monks in the American West, which is about the sense of place of Catholic monks and will be available, it sounds like next month from Trinity University Press. So check that out coming up and I'm sure Jason will bring it up again uh, over the course of the evening. If you have questions or any technical difficulties and are still able to chat during them, um, please put things in the chat. I will be monitoring that but we will have some time at the uh, back end of the webinar for questions and answers, um, at least 20 minutes. So most things will be saved until then to be asked, but feel free to populate the chat and I'll be monitoring it in case we need to ask something sooner than that or you need some technical help. You can also email me if needed at Colleen at forestguild.org. So I'll turn it over to Jason. Thanks again for being here. All right, yeah, thank you so much, Colleen, for that introduction and for the shout out to the book. It's good to see some of you, mostly just emotionally neutral fonts and your names, but I'm imagining a very enthusiastic uh, group of forest practitioners. And uh, I, these days, mostly am in the classroom and, and at my desk writing but I do get out into the forests of Vancouver and British Columbia, where I live and teach. Um, but I do have some forestry experience, so I know I'll be I'll be speaking pretty philosophically, theologically tonight. But just keep in mind that I have worked as a forester at least a little bit. <laughs> I worked for the Yale Forest for a season, and then for two seasons. Uh, with the Forest Service in Utah. So that was, and that was a real privilege for me. Um, but let me bring up my slides and dig in and take note of uh, uh, concepts you'd like me to clarify, elaborate on, or just want to revisit at some point. But basically, I want to take you through some of my thinking of an essay that I wrote on my blog um, about old growth, about the, the different uh, cultures, I guess you'd say, of understanding old growth. And it's part of a class that I teach at Simon Fraser University, which is which is sort of my dream class coming out of the Yale School of Forestry and the Divinity School, where I wanted to bring those two topics together. So I, I teach a, a class called Trees, Forests, and the Human Imagination. And we go over uh, the role of trees and forests in religion and mythology, literature, and then we kind of come to the contemporary conversations around uh, what a forest is and how human beings relate to forests. So this is a bit of uh, a snapshot from that wider panorama. But I've uh, being in Canada, I've had to try to stay abreast of the news in the United States. And it sounds like things are going quite well, <laughs> uh, except that they're not, but uh, we have some really interesting things happening around the topic of old growth. Growth. So at Society of American Foresters this year, we had a whole day at least of panels talking about the struggles of the different forest uh, management agencies to define and manage old growth. 
Um, so I, I attended a lot of those. I, I presented a, a session on uh, these sort of emerging conversations about the emotional qualitative side of relating to forests. Um, but we're working now with this new executive order and trying to implement an inventory. And uh, like British Columbia, where I live, the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management in the U.S. manage a lot of old growth and mature forests. And so this is exciting from a cultural standpoint, from a conservation standpoint, and from a climate resilience standpoint. So lots of really interesting things happening. Uh, one of the things I noticed at the Society of American Foresters was that almost exclusively the conversation was about uh, metrics, quantita quantifying quantitative metrics of old growth. So uh, we're talking about different ways to uh, separate out what constitutes old growth in terms of age, right? So for in BC, we have a different age classification for old growth on the coastal forest than we do inland and in the inner interior. Um, uh, what does species composition look like in the old growth succession phase? What does the structural diversity look like? Uh, what are the metrics and, and cutoffs and thresholds between, uh, you know, um, the stem exclusion phase and this and the and the understory reinitiation phase, structural diversity, species composition, and then of course, uh, you know, uh, Jerry Franklin's big aha moment in the 1970s and 80s around the necessity of woody debris. How much dead wood do we have, right? And so a lot of the the metrics coming out of the Forest Service assessment study from last year and the sessions I attended at SAF were oriented around these questions of quantification. But something that I was really encouraged by in this report that came out last year was this conversation about the narrative frameworks behind some of these. So they have lots of tables about the different Forest Service regions and how each region is going to define old growth and mature forest. They also have this conversation about what, it, what constitutes a narrative framework. So you can see in that second paragraph that old growth is also a, a sense a sensibility. But, uh, one of the participants in my workshop referred to it as old growthiness, right? There's a there's a quality to it, a qualitative sense to it. You know it when you feel it or see it or experience it. So I was very happy to see this narrative framework being used, although I'm not sure how that's being implemented, but sense of place, which is obviously very important to me in my writing. Spirituality, the word spiritual or spirit appears four times in the document, which I found to be quite uh, encouraging because a lot of Forest Service reports don't have that word. Um, so ecological knowledge, traditional, rural, ecological knowledge, indigenous science, right? All of these are at least on the table. So I found that to be very encouraging uh, moving forward. But as, but as I've been writing about this, one of the reasons that, um, one of the motivations for writing the essay, the uh, Give Me That Old Growth Religion essay that this talk's based on, came from a webinar with a guy named Gary Merkel, who's an indigenous forester who uh, wrote an old growth report for the province of British Columbia. Uh, which is a big push to shift the paradigm of British Columbia from a um, quantitative silvicultural approach to forestry to an ecosystem-based management approach, um, which you know the Forest Service, at least in, in the in the Northwest Forest Plan, right? This was at least theoretically supposed to start happening in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and. BC has been giving this lip service for a very long time, but it does seem that between the previous premier, John Horgan, and the and the the, the most recent premier, the new premier, John Ebby, uh, that we're seeing some actual boots on the ground 
in terms of funding to, to make this paradigm happen or this paradigm shift happen, which um, was pretty encouraging, but activists and folks are still kind of waiting to see what will happen. But he said in this webinar, they were asking Gary some questions about old growth and, and management and, well, you know, why is it taking so long to, to really internalize this into the institutions? And this is what he said. He said, a paradigm shift, right, going from one view of the world to another, he says, a paradigm shift is a fundamental shift in thinking. It's essentially a revolution in thinking. Think about it in your own life. For those of you who might have a certain religious orientation, change your religion tomorrow and think like that. That's what a paradigm shift is. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work to help people work through that. And so here we have uh, Gary Merkel kind of admitting that the debate and the conversation about old growth, which has been referred to as the war in the woods, is not just a bureaucratic question about thresholds and and quanti quantifying and that sort of thing, right? This is a deeply um, cultural and I would say religious conflict, right? Because it comes down to some fundamental axioms or assumptions about what the world is like, not just how we should behave in the world as people with different ideas and opinions, but what the very fabric of our world is like. And I find that very interesting. And so if you're wondering, well, right, how is managing for us like a religion? Well, I'm using a pretty broad definition of religion. So Paul Tillich, he's a Protestant theologian who spoke to the modern Malays. Uh, he says, religion is the state of being grasped by an ultimate concern. So it's not just the way we think of religion as a, a privately held belief system or even an institution, saying it's kind of the bedrock of who we are, of what the most important thing is in our life. What's our ultimate concern, right? For the, for the Dharmic religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, the ultimate concern is moksha, liberation from the cycle of birth and, re and rebirth, right? For the Abrahamic religions, it's about, uh, for Islam, submission to Allah, for Christians, about salvation, for Jews, about uh, uh, obedience to Torah or living the Torah. So when we're talking about trees and forests, right, an ultimate concern is basically something that informs the reason behind whatever we're doing, right? What are we doing? What is the world like? And how should we behave in that world? And it's my argument that in North America, the dominant institutions, which are you know set settler colonial institutions, have basically been having a debate uh, that that has two camps, right? There's sort of it's an oppositional kind of conversation, and there there's probably lots of places we could look to for the origin of this, right? We could talk about the debate between Gifford Pinchot and John Muir, that's kind of a, a, a popular way to talk about it. John Muir's sense of the sacredness of, of Hetch Hetchy and Yosemite and P Pinchot's sense of the sacredness of the efficiency and um, of, of forestry and preparing or making sure that there's enough trees and forests for future generations, right? That was a ultimate concern of Pinchot. So those are kind of foundational axioms. But one of the things that I think maybe more than anything really informs the contemporary conversation is a relationship between, uh, you know, these paradigms of the forest. So here's the examples that I like to use. There's probably lots of others. But in forestry school, we learned about um, the botanical sciences, the theories of, of plant succession and forest succession. And two pretty important names in that conversation were Frederick Clements and Henry Gleason. Right? These are the, oftentimes they're invoked to kind of contrast the different paradigm shifts 
in forest succession. Uh, Clemencian forestry sees the forest or the, the ecosystem as a kind of super organism that moves through predictable phases uh, and that disturbance is kind of an outsider, right? So that hypothetically, if we could manage the forest or protect the forest from outside threats, it would, it would continue in that state for a very long time. So that's where we get things like steady state, uh, words like steady state forestry or uh, climax forests. And, you know, the Forest Service in some of the manuals around botanical communities, they still use the language of kind of Clemencian ecology, that there's a climax species that is an indicator of what that climate determined ecosystem should be like, right? Like the, like an organism, a healthy organism. And in British Columbia, the way we uh, um, categorize our forest is through the biogeoclimatic uh, classification system. And that's also Clemencian, right? I live in the Western hemlock uh, forest type, which is a moist rainforest with hemlock, Western hemlock being the climax species. So even though Clemencian ideas sort of um, uh, were challenged by Gleason and at the Yale School of Forestry, uh, Clemens was very much uh, sidelined and marginalized from our theoretical conversations about forest succession. Um, he's still with us in a lot of ways. Uh, Henry Gleason, on the other hand, said, I'm not so sure, you know, that this is some sort of climatic predetermined uh, superorganism. I think it's a, a little more like individual, individually adapted plants who are assembling and adapting and, and you know, uh, uh, interacting, but that's a sort of, um, you know, circumstantial interaction. So for, for Gleason, it was a, a little more individualistic. We could say even market-based, right? This, there's an economy to the way that species interact. And uh, in the, after World War II, the Glissonian approach really took off in, in, in plant succession dynamics, you know, as, as evidence from my training at Yale. And I find it very interesting historically because Gleason's ideas really took off when the holistic and communalism of, the, of Soviet communism was culturally um, out of favor and even, you know, um, considered harmful to the world. So there's this really interesting, at least correlation coincidence between the rise of Clemencian ecology and then the replacement of that by Glissonian approaches and the overlap of the Cold War. Uh, Europe didn't have the same kind of paradigm shift at the time. And like I say, British Columbian um, biogeoclimatic approaches are quite Clemencian. So the reason I bring that up, even, you know, it's a bit of uh, trivia, I guess, for forest succession nerds, but I think there's an archetypal background to this, right? So this Clemencian view has persisted in environmentalist and activist um, experience of old growth. And Glissonian silviculture has been very much the foundation of the sort of mainline uh, forest industry responsible silvicultural approaches, right? So conservation versus preservation in the case of Gifford, Pinchot, and, and John Muir, and in you know the war in the woods, the loggers and the environmentalists. Another way to say that would be there's a kind of oppositional worldview in the West, right? There's this individualism that emphasizes competition, self-interest, uh, circumstantial assemblages of biodiversity with the organism as the base unit. And this more holistic or poetic or even metaphysical um, paradigm where co cooperation, mutual aid, biodiversity, uh, ecosystems as a unit, right? Or guilds at least. And, and those in many ways in the Western media have, be, have been kind of oppositional, right? So the foundation of individualism is, like I say, this sort of Gifford Pinchot's um, paradigm that there's that the ultimate concern, right, the ultimate reason why we're going to manage forests in this way 
is because uh, resources are vital to human flourishing. This is a utilitarian, a utilitarian world, right? So there's a sacred value at the heart of solo culture, which is the flourishing of human communities. So efficiency and, uh, you know, categorization and, you know, what James Scott calls legibility, the, the ability of institutions to read and discern uh, these forests, to rationalize them, is an important value. This is a sacred value. And so if we can especially manage quantities of timber over the long term, then that's considered sustainable, right? Sustained yield. And in some cases, sustained yield with constraints based on salmon habitat or erosion uh, or recreational values uh, or an endangered species, right? But that's essentially the world of the silvicultural approach that we, uh, our ultimate value is for the flourishing of human communities. Now take that to the other side of the spectrum and we have the romantics, right? The 19th century romantic poets influenced John Muir and Henry David Thoreau uh, and the, the surge of environmental activism that led to the sort of deep ecology, religiosity of the 80s and 90s. And here we have the kind of, you know, the the inverse image of the plantation, the, the efficiently managed plantation. And we have what I would call the sacred grove, right? So the romantic poets see a kind of animistic or vitalist presence in these places. They're essentially aesthetic value. And then ecology takes on a much more holistic um, experience, right? These aren't just individual trees. These are um, interconnected living organisms, right? You see that in some of the popular cultural representations, starting with my generation, so Fern Gully, but then the next generation we have things like Avatar, right? Where forests are essentially interconnected and woven together. And so the, the young man on this forest who's staring up into the canopy of this beautiful Western red cedar, right? Is, is there for scale to, to show that these ecosystems are bigger and, and older than humanity, that we're just this little piece of the bigger puzzle. But what often happens is that because this paradigm is still rooted in the Western world, we tend to simply flip the binary. So we go from plantation to wilderness, right? So, so what becomes the most valuable is the virginal, the primary, the wild, the unmanaged, right? And so the authentic and so there's a kind of fetishization in the anthropological sense of these big structures, these big trees, beings, and the aesthetics, the cathedral-like aesthetics of these forests that are understood or at least perceived to be free of human influence, free of human disturbance, right? There's this real oppositional um, kind of tension there, right? if not a plantation, then a wilderness. And we saw that play out in uh, Canada in the Clyquit Sound, right? This was in the wake of the Northwest Forest Plan and the, the spotted owl in Oregon and Washington. Up until recently, where Ferry Creek became uh, a new story, um, this was the largest act of civil disobedience. So the Neutral Nuth peoples collaborated with the activists, uh, settler activists, um, 900 people arrested, uh, blockades of roads uh, on these some of these old growth forests in on Vancouver Island. So this was a big a surge in public awareness about the value of old growth, about the interconnectedness of of forest ecosystems, and a real a demonization of the logger, the forester, the forest service in the U.S., right? 
that was that really saw this as a kind of uh, you know um, timber lobby dominated racket that was really just interested in extracting money from public lands in the taxpayer's pocket, which of course the foresters and the loggers found deeply offensive. But uh, we saw, you know, signs like this, what gives you the right to cut down trees older than Western society, right? We're, we're calling into the question, the origins, the paradigm at the heart or the root of, of Western society, but in a way that kind of flips it on its head. Um, and just for reference, I, I wanted to include this. Um, I hope all of you in the room, the, the virtual room, have listened to this series on Oregon Public Radio about the timber wars in Oregon and Washington. It's really uh, informative, a lot of uh, Jerry Franklin in this series, um, but make sure to put that on your playlist because it really does a good job of laying out a lot of the context for the culture war of the, of the Northwest Forest Plan that preceded it. But essentially, and yeah, in the West, we're seeing the continuation of this, or you know, in North America. So we'll have writers like Richard Powers, who wrote a novel, a great novel called *The Overstory*, assert this very holistic view. That he says there's no individuals; there aren't even separate species. Everything in the forest is the forest. Right? That's a, a radically holistic view of the forest. And uh, a lot of Richard Powers' um, plot and even one of his characters are based on Suzanne Simard, right, the Canadian forest ecologist who has put a lot of work into, um, you know, testing and uh, describing the ways in which uh, uh, trees and even different species of trees are connected through mycorrhizal networks. So she's taking an experimental approach to show or to, to add weight to this holistic view, right? So her, her memoir is actually really, really well written and she incorporates herself and her life and her struggle with cancer as, as herself kind of a mother tree. It's a really good read, but shows, right? How, how much sexism she faced uh, in, in the forest industry and just how much pushback she faced from this uh, fundamental axiom of the silvicultural uh, logger-dominated forest industry in BC that trees could cooperate, right? That that competition was the primary mode of interaction of individ of different individual species. But Samard showed that competition is not the only way that these trees interact. Another very controversial claim in this camp. Of, of holism would be Peter Wallaben's book, The Hidden Life of Trees, which basically anthropomorphizes trees as having their own kind of personalities and self-interest, having friends and enemies, cooperating, getting sick, feeling pain. Uh, and it's a really, it's a great read, but it's gotten a lot of pushback from forest ecologists in Europe and, and North America for overextending what they would see as a metaphor, right? That, trees behave like social beings. But I think folks like Samard and, and Wallabin would say it's not a metaphor, right? These are, trees are beings that interact and have, have very similar, um, you know, uh, interests, right, than, than most biological organisms. So it doesn't bother me to use the language of families and individuals and societies. But there's been some critique, right? There's been several peer-reviewed studies in the last two years or so that are calling into question just how common, right, the mycorrhizal networks are or how much the resource sharing is from mother trees to young sprouting trees. So there's some, you know, uh, the process of science is, is, is evidence-based. So there's been some real pushback. But a lot of that pushback is coming from folks rooted in the more individualistic view of old growth trees, right? So this, uh, this evolutionary biologist, Toby Kears says, where some scientists see a big cooperative collective, I see reciprocal exploitation. 
right? So some some real pushback on this surge of holistic views that started in the 80s and 90s. And that's kind of I, that's kind of the major um, poles, if you will, in the Western imagination, right? On the one end, this extreme kind of plantation approach where efficiency is the highest value. And on the other, this more aesthetic and metaphysical approach where the collective, the whole, is the highest value. But in both, human beings aren't quite at home, right? Where an ecosystem is something that exists almost in a, in a way independent from human beings. And so, as we'll see in a minute, um, I think there's a third way, right, between these really oppositional um, approaches. But first, I want to give a couple of examples from British Columbia. In BC, we have a, a pretty straightforward definition for old growth. Uh, in the interior, it's something like anything that's um, 140 years plus, and then on the coast, it's 250 years plus. So it's primarily an age-based definition of old growth um, based on the forest types that we find. Now, um, that that has meant that the, the Ministry of Forestry has put out some numbers that say, we're doing pretty well with our old growth, right? We've got a quarter of it left, right? BC, this is the BC government. There are 13 million hectares of old growth in BC. 10 million of these are old growth forests, are, are protected or not economical to harvest. So old growth is about 23%. So I don't understand why you guys are so upset with us. The, you know, the old growth activists, whereas the Ancient Forest Alliance, one of the major players in the conservation movement and the old growth protection, uh, you know, um, kind of coalition that have that have take, undertaken civil disobedience and blockades and, and, and the like, they say, no, there's only 3%. And so the big disagreement here is really over uh, the site quality index. So you can see here, that BC uses a site quality index, and uh, the the higher quality um, the higher quality site indexes uh, make up for a lot less of the old growth. So you can see that the lower the site quality index, so that's usually very steep or very high up uh, terrain, is has the lion's share of so called old growth by the the age-based criteria. So if you get to the site indexes of the high, the real productive lowland forest, we're looking at a very slender margin of old growth forest uh, in the, the old growth phase that's left. And so that's where we get um, activist, uh, you know, confrontations with police like the Ferry Creek conflict, which as you can see here is a beautiful bowl shaped valley that is completely free of any kind of uh, heavy uh, silvicultural management prescriptions, right? So you can see this Google map here, lots of um, fairly large uh, harvests, right? They won't, they probably wouldn't say clear cut. I don't mind saying clear cuts, but you can see here, Ferry Creek is, is a, is a, in, um, Un, it's not, it has not been clear cut, right? Certainly it has been managed by indigenous peoples for thousands of years, um, which we're gonna talk about in a second, but in terms of industrial management, not so much. So this this created a huge controversy in BC, much like, uh, you know, uh, Clayquit Sound and a lot of the, the, the um, Northwest forestry culture wars, right? But even within, even within the First Nations communities, there was a lot of disagreement about how to proceed because in British Columbia, we're not just talking about a power broker like the, the province um, going up against the conservationists and activists anymore, right? That was the 80s and 90s. Now, with all of the treaties being, being negotiated in British Columbia, indigenous people are finally reclaiming the sovereignty that they have deserved for the last 200 years, um, you know, prior to settler colonialism. And so we're seeing a very interesting landscape where the province feels like they can't exactly uh, 
grant the conservation folks their concessions and, and just set aside Ferry Creek as a wilderness or a protected area because it's part of at least three, probably more different First Nations that want that that now have to be consulted about the future of those places. So we're seeing all these old growth logging deferments and all this question and distrust about whether or not the deferments are holding. And even within the, the tribes themselves, uh, for example, in the Pachidat and the Didat um, communities, right? The Didat basically came to the protesters and said, get out of here, right? We're going to take care of this. We don't want you blocking these roads. You're, you weren't invited here. And then folks like the Pachidat elder Bill Jones claiming publicly that he had a, has more of a right to the um, to the hereditary uh, chief role than his than the tribe the tribe's current hereditary chief and saying basically I've invited the protesters here so they they can be here so lots of internal politics as well but it really shows that this you know binary between civil culture industry government and conservation ecology holism is starting to unravel a bit when it comes to actually uh, the resurgence of indigenous sovereignty in BC. And it's actually a really interesting um, conversation that's that's unfolding. So for example, the Hawaiian uh, chief Robert Dennis has said, for years we've been subject to colonial policy, right? He's talking about the government. Some outside force, mainly the federal government, comes onto our land and says, we're going to take care of you and we're going to do things better than you've been doing, right? This is certainly analogous to the American context. Now, now listen to what he says uh, in response to Ferry Creek. He says, now I'm seeing some outside force saying, oh, you know what? We want to halt old growth logging. And when we do that, we want to halt the First Nations right to harvest cedar for cultural purposes. We want to infringe on their treaty rights. I'm seeing systemic racism continuing. You Indians don't have the ability to carry yourselves. So we're going to fight for you. And we're going to protect the old growth, whether you like it or not. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they're saying. So clearly a controversial thing to say. A lot of activists would, would push back on this. And even folks within his own nation would push back on this. But that's how Robert Dennis sees the situation. That the old growth logging, the old growth um, holistic approach is actually just as colonial as the silvicultural approach. And that, I think, brings us to um, a way forward in this sort of war of the woods. And so from the gospel of efficiency to the sacred grove to home, and I think this is the way that rural, both rural and indigenous peoples, have related to forests for a very long time. And just uh, direct your eyes to this quote by Giselle Maria Martin, who's an activist on Vancouver Island. She says about the forest, this is our garden. We don't have a word for wilderness in neutral news languages. The closest translation is home, right? So we're not talking about a plantation. We're not even talking about a complex adaptive system, right? That's a mechanistic construction of a forest. Uh, Giselle says, this is home, right? I'm at home here. And I find that to be the most compelling sort of um, foil or, you know, pushback or contradiction to this very rigid sort of pole binary between uh, plantation and wilderness, right? The old growth forest as a sacred precinct and the old growth forest as a um, pile of rotting wood, right? Like the, the sort of stereotypical logger would say, right? That the, the old growth forest is overripe, right? Decadent. And so in the name of efficiency, we need to harvest it and regenerate that forest, right? So those are the, you know, those were the two poles. But I think that people who live in rural places, people who manage forests, small wood, woodland owners, and uh, many indigenous peoples, would say, uh, would would probably resonate more with this approach, right? That forests are um, communities and human beings are a part of those communities. So in indigenous worlds, the forest 
was not a separate domain or an institution. It was integrated into family and, and, and religion and foodways and craft, right? So the red, the Western red cedar, for example, that's a big um, symbol of old growth in the Pacific West were intensively managed for cordage and for planks and for medicines. And so in these, in the wilderness areas that we have in the Pacific West, when you find these big cedars, there's usually evidence of some indigenous management, harvesting, right? So the today's wilderness areas were indigenous um, forest gardens in a sense. And I think that that is the most um, inspiring way to look at the possibility of human beings um, finding a place in the world. Uh, we're talking a lot about climate anxiety and climate grief. And I think the institutions of plantation and wilderness are not very well suited to the way forward. And I think we're really wrestling with what it means to be at home in this world in the West, right? Indigenous people know who they are and why they're here. But the West, we're having a real wrestle with that. And I think we can look to indigenous peoples and their approach to old growth without appropriating their ways of life uh, to, to find ways to reintegrate ourselves into the world. And, you know, it's sort of in some ways symptomatic of an urban culture, right? I don't, I don't know if folks have read The Trouble with Wilderness by William Cronin, a kind of a controversial essay about the history, the cultural history of wilderness. But he says, he claims, right, only people whose relation to the land was already alienated could hold up wilderness as a model for human life in nature. For the romantic ideology of wilderness leaves precisely nowhere for human beings actually to make their living from the land, right? So he's uh, uh, native of Wisconsin, right? Really writes a lot about the in-between places, the rural places, the ponds, the woodlots, and those sorts of things, and the powerful beauty and uh, you know sacredness that those places have for him there and for many rural peoples. And I think that that's a lot closer to something like this, right? That this is our home, rather than this very contentious um, conflict between the plantation and the wilderness. Another really important indigenous voice, uh, Kyle White, who's a citizen Potawatomi philosopher, writing a lot about uh, resilience and about uh, climate collapse. Uh, he's also reclaiming the word science, right? It's not just traditional ecological knowledge that we file in the appendix of the environmental impact assessment as a sort of fun fact about the place. Indigenous science is a method of survival that is integral of spirituality. And so in, in, in many times when indigenous peoples engage in an ecological restoration project, they're not restoring an ecosystem to a perceived historical baseline and then walking away or going on walks on trails. They're restoring uh, a world that they're, they are themselves a part of. Right, so an ecosystem all too often is an abstract word for the world without us. An ecosystem is what the world should be like without us. And you know, the urbanized settler colonial aesthetic, we, re we really enjoy going for walks in that. But we've got to make a living. And so the logger and the forester say, we're going to do this right. We're going to do it efficiently. And I don't know why you have such a big problem with that, right? So we have these oppositional views. And I think the rural and the indigenous perspective is really needed and crucial right now. That any kind of ecological restoration that we're doing should include us, right? That we should find a place for ourselves in the world again, that the West has, we have sort of alienated ourselves from. And so that means getting uncomfortable with our quantitative and qualitative, you know, domains and spirituality and science, right? The mind and the heart, right? So we're going to start to have some of these 
conversations. But I think that is a really good way to think about uh, an alternative to this oppositional view, which I'll, I'll just sum that up here. And we'll have, we'll have lots of time for well, lots of time for discussion because I kind of blaze through this. So I'm happy to revisit any of the slides once I sum this up. But basically what I want to say is that there are kind of three cultural perspectives, or even you could say religious perspectives on this notion of old growth. The first being that trees are essentially or fundamentally crops, right? That wood is a resource to be managed efficiently and prudently for human society. And that that's a sacred value, right? Efficiency and the flourishing of human communities is primary. And that essentially, right, we are, uh, human subjects are um, the most valuable entities and that trees are essentially natural objects that should be managed efficiently, but their, their value is primarily instrumental. It's not intrinsic necessarily. So that's a very common uh, view in the sort of civil cultural in the logging uh, world, right? At least as it's rooted in the West. But the opposite of that, right? The romantic view is simply that mere image, right? That old growth forests are sacred precincts, they're wilderness, they're, you know, they're, they're, their virginal quality makes them sacred. When in the 19th century, we were kind of getting uncomfortable with the language of God. And so nature took its place, right? So old growth forest is a great kind of archetypal uh, encounter with the divine without having to say the G word. And so these are places that are wild, that are untainted, they're authentic, and they're in, in, in the language, we've tried to sort of nuance our language and sophisticate our language, but we're still using the language of systems, of objects, of machines, of mechanisms, when we say that an ecosystem is a complex adaptive system, right? Yeah, there's a lot more moving pieces and the pieces influence each other, but that language is still essentially sterile, culturally sterile. And last, I would say, and you know, from for this presentation, I'm sure there's lots of other ways to do this, but the the third would be that land is a community of beings where place and species are related, and in some cases that means uh, familial relation. So we have rights and responsibilities. So reciprocity is an etiquette of the land, right? It's not just that uh, you know, this romanticized view that indigenous peoples think that the world has intrinsic value and therefore they should care for it. It's the ethos of survival that says that if we take care of the world, the world will take care of us. Human beings are not a problem to be solved. We are members of the community, right? Who have responsibilities to the other members of that community. I think Aldo Leopold gets close to this when he says that, you know, that the world is a community that the ecosystem is a community and that we're just plain citizens. But I think a lot of his work has been appropriated into the holistic ecological view that sees human beings as essentially on the outside of that community, that we need to protect that community from ourselves. And I think rural and indigenous peoples have a much more um, reciprocal view of old growth and of forests in general. And uh, so um, I've, I've spoken a little bit about how this is inspired by some of my reading of indigenous communities and their projects. But I also draw a lot of inspiration in my own lineage from the, in the Christian tradition from Wendell Berry. And this quote is one of my favorites of all times, but I think it speaks to the direction that we might want to head in this time of climate collapse of ecological grief. Um, and uh, uncertainty about the future of forests in general, and not just old growth. He says, no settled family or community has ever called its home place an environment. None has ever called its feeling for its home place biocentric or anthropocentric. None has ever thought of its connection to its home place as ecological, deep or shallow. 
The concepts and insights of the ecologists are of great usefulness in our predicament, and we can hardly escape the need to speak of ecology and ecosystems. But the terms themselves are culturally sterile. They come from the juiceless abstract intellectuality of the universities, which was invented to disconnect, displace, and disembody the mind. The real names of the environment are the names of rivers and river valleys, creeks, ridges and mountains, towns and cities, lakes, woodlands, lanes, roads, creatures and people. And the real name of our connection to this everywhere different and differently named earth is work. And I think that's one of the most powerful statements of the idea that the land is home and that humans should be a part of that community uh, in the in the Christian tradition that I've ever read. And so now that we now that um, I've come to the end of the slides, we have lots of time for discussion. And so I'm happy to revisit any of these slides um, or to hear folks' uh, reactions or questions. But um, yeah, that's what I have. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, that was a wealth of information and uh, you were very articulate in talking us through all of that. Um, we do have lots of time for discussion and questions. Um, I'm seeing kudos coming through in the chat and some reactions of applause on the screen. Anybody want to ask or share anything else? We'll start with something that just came in the chat. How do we incorporate some of this into the story of our own forests? Uh, good question, Annie. I think I would like to ask that question of you as well. Like, I don't know where, what, you, what context you're working in, but I think that is one of the big lessons from the Wendell Berry quote is that we really need to listen to the places uh, and not just in a metaphorical way, right? Really trying to sink our roots deeply into place. And I do that, you know, I, I try to walk out my front door and I do that, right? I have a south facing house. I'll walk out the front door at night to see where the moon is, to see if Orion is back in the sky, uh, to, to see what the crows are doing and if the, if the raven is nearby that lives in my neighborhood. Uh, so yeah. I don't have a prescription for you, Annie, but I, I just have a practice, which is just to, to listen and to be with the place. And, and that, I think, is what the Indigenous experience really points to. It isn't that Indigenous peoples are somehow inherently or genetically more spiritual than the West, that their, their resistance to settler colonialism has kept them in contact with cultures that have survived in these places for thousands of years. The bones of their ancestors are in this ground. Their creation stories come out of these places. And so uh, when you when we commit to that, I think it's a, it's inevitable that cultures will begin to turn back to belonging to their places. And that's actually what I found when I started interviewing Catholic monks who have lived in one place for a few decades, not generations, but decades, is that their stories and their spiritual experiences and their epiphanies and their hard realizations are written in their hearts, but they're also written in the landscape. So these places are sacred landscapes for them um, in a way that at least gestures toward the way that indigenous peoples have cultivated that relationship over millennia. Well, I do agree with what you're saying, oh, hi, but I also are. think hi. that, yeah, yeah, I'm here. I didn't see that. Uh, you see I, I think, you know, we, those of us who believe what you just said to some extent or another, um, we walk a, a fine line in terms of how we are able to market and 
do our work and at the same time honor the gifts that we have to be a part of all the things you're talking about mm -hmm. and i think we need to maybe even do a training through the guild but to actually help uh ourselves those of us who really are looking at this in the way you're describing to walk to walk through how we can develop this into the story of our place um our our marketing materials are you know it's to me it's also a political issue of uh, this is what i believe and um this is my bottom line and um and i want to share that story and a lot of people that don't ever think about those things are like oh wow i never thought about that but then i ask well what about your place and then they they out some things but i i think we need to work together to figure out how we can integrate these these concepts and also our own personal land that we hopefully know well how, how mm. do we create that as part of our marketing so we make a bold statement right out right out yeah. front with our products with our workshops with our tourism yeah. whatever it is yeah, the, the good thing about living in living into a catastrophe is that literally everything needs to be done and every there's every aspect of life has some call to action, right? So um yes, I, yes. honestly, I, I don't have big answers. I, I'm I really personally believe that we're living through a kind of dark night of the civilizational soul. And that doesn't yes. mean that doesn't mean it's a hard necessarily a hard time, even though it is. It means it's uncertain where we're headed. And I think the West is really, really having to do some soul searching about what it, how it is we want to live in this world if we want to continue to live. Uh, and there's, you know, there's two temporalities to apocalypse, right? Indigenous peoples have already lived through apocalypse. And, and settler folks like myself, we're getting anxious about the one that we see coming. And indigenous people are... Uh, you know, bracing for another one in, in many ways. And there's lots of really good writers about this, right? So Kyle White wrote, writes about this. It's a great novel, um, a Canadian author whose last name is Rice. And the book is called The, the Moon of the Crusted Snow. And it's a novel about basically an unspecified catastrophe that, that knocks out all of civilization and this community has to sort of survive on their own and grapple with the legacy of colonialism and their own skills. And, and there's a scene where the, this grandmother uh, basically says, we've been through this before and here it is again, right? So, so there's some interesting temporalities to this, but it really just starts out your front door in a lot of ways. I, I do like to go to the, to the forest parks near my house I love them. I love the rainforest, but I also um, try when I go out my front door to to tune in to what's what's in my front garden, the bird feeder, right, and to the street trees in the city that I live in, and then the park that used to be a quarry, Queen Elizabeth Park used to be a quarry. I go there, right. So it starts there in a lot of ways. Well, we probably yeah. should get to some other questions, though, but we still have a lot of time, right, Colleen? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Annie. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. So we have some things coming up in chat that are really rich questions around tensions um, and our role, our relationship. Um, and let's start with the, the very next one that came in, because I think it'll feed somewhat into the rest of this. And it's uh, I'm biased because this one's really close to my heart and my work as well. Can you talk a little more about the concept of reciprocity? Um, Linda asks. Yeah, okay, so well, uh, in if I was teaching one of my university classes on religion and ecology, I would, I would probably uh, um, frame the conversation this way, that uh, when it comes to the ethics of how we relate to each other, um, one of the primary modes of, of relating to the world in the monotheistic tradition is the human-God relationship, right? So the Torah, 
the Ten Commandments for the for Jewish folks, you know, the, at least the first half of the Ten Commandments are about that human God relationship, right? I don't want idolatry in in your lives. That is uh, the relation the relationship between humans and Yahweh in that in that uh, Neolithic and monotheistic culture, right? The next half of the Ten Commandments is about the human human dynamic. Okay, I don't want you stealing. I don't want you, uh, you know, cheating on your spouses. I don't want you killing, right? Coveting. Those are human human dynamics, right? And they're reciprocal, right? It's the golden rule: do unto others as you would have done unto you. That you find that in the Torah, you find that in the Quran, and of course in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. The third dynamic, which I think the animists and the polytheists in Hinduism indigenous traditions are much better at is this relationship between humans and the world the non-human species so in if you have a if you have a world where reincarnation is taken for granted right there's a lot of spiritual diversity to the beings in the world or if you find yourself in a kin group whose primary ancestor is raven or killer whale or wolf or grizzly bear right then there's a much richer set of responsibilities that you owe to the world. So reciprocity is the etiquette of interbeing, of interacting. And the etiquette for an animist, right, includes personhoods other than human. Right? That's a bit tricky for some Western folks to wrap our heads around, that there are personhoods other than the human. So there's salmon people and mountain people, and there's dead ancestral people, and there's uh, wolf people and grizzly bear people, right? And each of those peoples have a culture that has a specific set of expectations and criteria for interacting. And human beings, if you want to survive, right, you need to keep the taboos, and you need to, um, you need to observe the proper etiquette. So for example, off the west coast of Vancouver Island, if you wanted to go whaling, you didn't just check the weather, right? You made sure your equipment was good. You consulted with a shaman, you fasted, you abstained from sex. You made sure that the whale visited you in a dream and you made sure your partner uh, spouse was observing the proper taboos on their end. And then you went out and hunted for whales. And if you did it right, the whale would gift themselves to you because that's the arrangement that we have, right? That the whale is both a relation and a gift, right? So in the West, if we say that a whale is a person, then we want to bestow on them the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And then, you know, they're completely off limits. We have to treat them like a human being. But in polytheistic, animistic cultures and I guess pre-industrial, Western, rural, esoteric cultures in our own lineages, the Celtic and the and the Germanic, the Scandinavian. Reciprocity was a much more complicated arrangement. Right? To live in a world where just human beings are subjects is a lot easier. And we still haven't gotten that done very well. Right. So if if it's just humans and then everything else is a natural object, that's a, a much easier set of ethics. <laughs> but if the world is full of personhoods, that's a complicated world. Right. And that's the that's that's where reciprocity comes in when it comes to indigenous and, and polytheist and uh, rural and esoteric cultures. All right, Linda, does that make sense? Linda Churchill. Maybe Linda's not with us. Is, is there another question you want to paraphrase for me? Uh, sure. Actually, Wait, following, a, following, up on, following up on that one, um, someone was chatting as you were talking, uh, and Linda says yes. Thank you, by the way. God, oh, good. Yeah, you're welcome, Linda. <clears throat> God was separated from creation. This gave man the license to exploit creation. Do you have comments on that? That's a that's a pretty fair assessment that the Abrahamic religions really emphasize the transcendence of God, the otherness of God. Of course, that's not across the board. We have a lot of imminent and mystical 
theology in the Abrahamic religions. And my my personal Christianity is deeply imminent and definitely heretical, pantheistic, uh, you know, God and the world are not not separable. Um, but so, but yeah, that's kind of what happened with uh, the classical Abrahamic theologies, that God's sovereignty and and you know, insuperability became this deep transcendence that we couldn't, it was completely separate from the world. Okay, thank you. Uh, John mentioned, this gets to some of these tensions, while forest loss worldwide has slowed somewhat in recent years, the earth continues to lose thousands of acres of forest each day, most of it to agricultural conversion. Even so, there's not enough food produced annually to feed the world. Forest conservation directly related to human population growth. What do we do? Mm, no, I don't. I don't do that. You know, don't you know the answer, right? <laughs> I don't <laughs> solve the world's problems in these. Um, but I definitely want to name all of those problems as real, and I want to grieve those problems. And we're going to have to sit with those problems for many decades to come. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty around what is the right thing to do with those problems right so i want to stay stay there for a while right like this is hard this is sad i don't know but one of the things that i also really believe right is around the land clearance is a lot of the forest ecology of of the tropics and the amazon is that tropical forests are a lot more resilient than we expected and that second growth forests can be enriched and restored in, in pretty significant ways. Certainly not to pre-disturbance levels, but in pretty significant ways. And it turns out that before uh, Europeans invaded South America, that there was a lot more dense populations in South America and a lot more um, overt management of those places that the the dark earth terra preta for example was essentially an indigenous technology to keep the soils fertile uh, which you know incorporated um, charcoal and pot shards and that to help solve the problem of this perpetually um, infertile soils in the tropics so a lot of solutions coming out of these place-based cultures and not all of them were successful Indigenous peoples before colonialism in North and South America made big mistakes. There were big me megafauna extinctions in lots of places. And they figured it out and they came back and they found sustainable systems that would work. And I think, I think we're on that same trajectory. The question is whether or not the global significance of our mistakes are going to allow us to really course correct in time. But there's a there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties about what might happen, and I think there's a lot of a lot to do, and we should be trying lots of different things in lots of different places, but primarily, um, we need to hunker down, I think, in our places, and really learn and listen to those places moving forward. So I think that segues a little bit into some of these more specific um, conundrums. How mm -hmm. do these, uh, this one is from Nicholas. How do these concepts of human interaction with the forest influence how we should intervene during instances of destructive forest pests, specifically thinking about chemical treatments or biological control where trees would decline and die and ecosystems be compromised without intervention? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have enough detail in that in that context to really respond. I'm not sure what ecosystem or what context he's referring to. Um, and so I, I'm not going to venture there. Like, I'm not a technician. I don't know. But I do know that reintegrating natural disturbances like fires will go a long way to helping with some of the um, resilience of forests against insect pests right so we don't have to re revert to chemical treatments right so uh being more more um willing being more willing to 
manage complex landscapes with fire, I think will help a lot with that. But this is a room full of foresters. I feel like there's a lot more expertise on some on that question than I can speak to. So um, maybe we'll I'll pass the rest of that question on. Sure, and I mean a lot of a lot of folks in the guild are doing a lot of good. Yeah, work. yeah. Um, so if you do want to discuss this and and chime in, please do. If you're listening, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can open that up. Um, I hope I'm saying this right. Armin uh, mentions excellent talk and thought provoking ideas. I'm also curious about how you think grasslands could be included in these ideas of old growth communities. To me, the framework of seeing the intrinsic value of a forest, in this case, a grassland, works well to steward these natural communities. Grasslands are not forests, and thus it is difficult to assess their age, quote unquote, which is the part that makes it more difficult to communicate their importance or value to the contemporary world. Maybe this is a comment more than a question. <laughs> mm, I love it. Giving some voice to the grasses and the grasslands. And those were intensively managed, right? The Buffalo commons of the of the Middle West of, of, of North America were managed with fire to exclude trees. And, you know, the, the historic photos of even the, the Rocky Mountains in the West, right? Trees were a lot less dense before we started excluding fire. Indigenous people used fire to keep these forests pretty open. Uh, and, and that was both uh, a, a food systems decision, right? These were, they were managing these places for game and food systems, but it was also in the language of biodiversity, right? It created a much, more diverse uh, matrix of of habitat, so that's a good thing. And grasslands should be a part of that. The aestheticization of trees as a signifier of nature, right? So what I mean by that is that trees have come to be stand-in for natural nature, and a grassland it doesn't seem like it's necessarily very natural is a bad thing, right? We need to see all of our landscapes as, in their own ways, beautiful. And, and the deep soil of grasslands is, is really important to that, right, so. So in your communicating the importance of grasslands um, in your way of thought, would it be around the soils and the biodiversity that's there? How would you communicate that importance? Well, the people of the grasslands need to figure out who they are in relation to the grasslands. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, so are you, it isn't an aesthetic thing, you know, people of the prairies aren't just, it isn't going to do us any good if they just like the way they look, right? These are, what what relationship do we have to the grass and the grasslands and the species that historically populate them? Or the species that could ha habitate in those places now that we have a global, we have access to a global biodiversity and genetic engineering and the climate is changing, right? What novel ecosystems might emerge in forests and grasslands that could meet the challenges of the anth so-called Anthropocene, right? So it's not just about looking backwards to aestheticize natural and wild and, and intact ecosystems and ecosystem integrity. I think we're going to have to let go of some of those sacred uh, concepts as we move into climate chaos and novel ecosystems and naturalizing species. Um, but that's probably a, a, a webinar for another time. <laughs> I'm not as averse to invasive species as some folks. And I think, I think e evolution and ecosystems are dynamic and always changing and that human beings can actually play a really generative role in that. But in the West, we seem to have this notion that it either has to be as an intensively managed plantation for economic purposes or a restored intact ecosystem that we marvel at in for its beauty and biodiversity. And that's that I think that's too simplistic of a world. And climate change is 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 destroying that world. That world is dying and we need to maybe grieve that world together, but but something else is being born in its place. And there's a lot of really beautiful ecosystems that could emerge 
even as we lose species and as we lose people uh, to famine and and die off and drought and all of the terrible things that are coming. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to make sure some of this is voiced. There's a few comments here, and then you'll have a chance to respond to them. Uh, John says, thanks. This is very enlightening and especially pertinent to all of our lives. There's no more important task than restoring the sacred hoops of life wherever it is being broken or threatened. And Tanya says, thank you very much for this presentation, Jason. It makes me think of the 17 principles of environmental justice made in 1991 at the first People of Color Summit, which includes sacredness in principle one. Environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species, and the right to be free from ecological destruction. Uh, Tanya also says, to note Dr. Kyle Powell's White is on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. Curious your thoughts, Jason, on how conversations about environmental justice are shifting and how we think of and talk about our sense of place, conservation, and et cetera, mm -hmm. through that lens. Yeah, hi, Tanya. I know Tanya. We're friends from Yale. Um, so I, I reference Kyle, right? I give him a shout out in my slides because I think he's doing really important work around showing that indigenous restoration is both scientific and that it's not ecosystem based primarily, right? It's about restoring a world that indigenous peoples are a part of, right? And so the, the, the sh the shepherding that I'm doing of the westerns of Western civilization is to say I think maybe we should uh, be thinking more about our place in the world rather than just uh, making money or fixing what we've broken right that's the sort of wilderness plantation dynamic and the justice piece is always and always and forever right justice is. Uh, deeply embedded in all of these conversations. The war in the woods was basically just this very loud settler colonial argument that marginalized indigenous peoples from their very nuanced approaches. But I'm very encouraged by your work, Tanya, because you're doing a lot of this in the in the with the Forest Service, integrating these principles of environmental justice. And I feel like I can see that in the Forest Service, report that I cited at the beginning, right? The old growth report where there at least seems to be some gesturing and acknowledgement that indigenous peoples have to be uh, taken seriously, not just consulted, not just included at the back in the appendix of the environmental impact assessment, but actually empowered and, and consulted as equals. And we're a long way off from that. But the, in British Columbia, it seems like forestry in the next few decades is going to be radically different than it was in the in the in the last few decades, um, because of the treaty negotiations that are returning rights and title and and profit sharing and co management in a lot of different ways, which Indigenous people are uh, reclaiming what is theirs, and I think in a in a kind of post-colonial landscape, right? We'll have these federated communities of indigenous peoples and uh, post-settler colonial peoples. And we'll probably always still have these really industrial urban hubs, uh, but we're moving towards justice, even if it's slowly. Thank you, Jason. Nice to Hi. see you. Yeah, good to hear you at least. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have anything they'd like to ask or share? The chat has quieted. Okay. You certainly do not have to do it in chat either. You can uh, just speak up if you like. We have a few minutes left. Yeah, I mean, I hope that folks get the sense that what I'm excited about talking about is a big open question, right? I don't, I don't bill myself as an expert that's telling folks how to how to move forward, but I think 
I think the work that I've done is at least interesting and useful for naming or describing kind of the predicament that we're in. And the third way that I present is, is one of many possible ways forward, but it's not necessarily the only way. And so, uh, yeah, for me, just having these conversations is a real privilege. And so I hope uh, that maybe we can keep having them. Well, thanks. That's a kind of a segue about a question I came up with, which um, I know, Jason, you're, you're a fairly newer guild member, uh, but in our work with policy and empowering landowners, empowering next gen stewards and hosting events like this and in person events where stewards can come together and really share ideas and questions and challenges and successes. Among all of that, um, is there is there more? Is there something in particular? Has something stood out to you about the the guild's role? What what can we be doing in this most important work? Um, or other organizations who the folks on this call are are all representing? And we've mentioned you know getting real local, finding home, listening to where we are so we can understand and become embodied uh, in what we can learn from place and then be able to mm -hmm. express that out. Uh, in that expression out, in that sharing out, what are some of the things that you've been uh, most pleased to see the guild doing or others doing? And where do you think there's still some pretty significant gaps from organizational and community perspectives like this? Mm. Well, it's, it's, all, it's all hands on deck, basically, right? We're, we're, um, things are getting worse and scary fast. So I guess I want, yeah, like the Society of American Foresters talk um, was a, was a space where people came to this workshop where I talked about old growth. I talked about some of the cultural dimensions of these things. And, and people said that it was a space that was really deeply needed in that, in that conference, which was primarily focused on, on quantitative metrics and technological or, or just more technical issues, which absolutely we need to have those conversations. We need to workshop um, technique, technology uh, and methodol methodologies. But I'm really interested in opening up more spaces for the emotional, spiritual conversations about how hard it is to do the work that we're doing in, this, in these times as a looming crisis emerges. And, uh, and so I would like the Guild to maybe have more conversations about creative ecologies, collaborative ecologies, ecological grief, uh, and then exploring all of the frontiers of ways that we can connect with our places that don't just balance the silvicultural and ecosystem-based paradigms, right? That that are really looking creatively to how people relate to places, which includes emotional, spiritual, symbolic, cultural um, conversations. So I would like to be the theologian in residence for the the guild is what I'm saying. <laughs> the chaplain, the ecological chaplain in residence. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. That's very affirming for the work I do uh, on the side as well with Nature's Good Company. And just um, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you. I'm just so grateful to be here. And I wish I wish we could shake hands with everybody and, and chat more informally. But uh, I, I put my email in the chat. If you'd like to get in touch, I'd be happy to talk more about this stuff, especially around uh, spiritual ecology or ecological grief. Um, my website's holyscapes.org and I, I post essays there. The Give Me That Old Growth Religion essay is posted there, the whole, the whole thing. And some of the writing I've been doing lately on ecological grief. So thanks. Thank you so much. I'll also share this one more time, the uh, cover for the book coming out in February. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited that the book, the, the, the 400 page dissertation is now a 140 page book. So that's much more, much more readable. Thank you for that. <laughs> and there'll be a, there'll be a, probably an online book launch 
So um, if you want to hear about that, you can you know, sign up for my email list at the website. I'll probably, I'll be promoting, or I'll be at least letting people know about the online or in-person events associated with the book. And I also have a new role at, at SFU as a, as a kind of pilot project as an ecological chaplain. So a lot of my energy right now is about um, helping students talk about their feelings about climate and and ecological destruction, which is probably why I made it into this talk quite a bit because it's what I've been thinking about a lot over the last few months. So anyway, awesome. so I'm very grateful for your at least uh, at least digital presence and uh, please continue to do good work out there and take good care of your forests and start uh, right outside your front door. Thank you again, Jason. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, do remember we have another Communicating Forestry series webinar coming up in late February. I believe it's February 27th. Um, this one is talking about photography and how photos can help us tell the story of our work. And we'll get into some technical tips and also more philosophical conversation around that topic as well. And if you have other ideas for the Communicating Forestry series, or if you're a Guild member who'd like to host um, or present like Jason did tonight, please let me know at membership at forestguild.org. And uh, we will follow up and keep this series going through this year. Um, it's been really exciting and I appreciate everyone's enthusiasm. I think Tanya should give a talk about environmental justice. All right. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a lovely evening.